Hello and welcome to um, another video of some sort. My name is Gareth Dennis, I'm a rail engineer uh, in the UK and this is the first video of a series that I'll do that probably will never end because there are so many of them. Uh, it's a series about gadget bands. If gadget bands were a family then this episode will be all about its dodgy uncle. That's right, I'm going to be talking about Maglev. <laughs> I suppose the question that some of you might have is, what exactly is a gadget ban? A uh, gadget ban is a descriptor I picked up watching um, Justin Rosniak, aka Do Not Eat's exquisite takedown of um, Elon Musk and the Boring Company's ridiculous loop proposal. More on that in future videos. And in turn, Justin picked it up from Alan Levy's Pedestrian Observations blog. Alan, in turn, picked it up from Anton Dubrow's Cat Bus blog, which is also excellent. You can Google those pretty easily, but I'll stick links in the description. A gadget ban is personal rapid transit, loop, hyperloop, maglev, sort of stuff hanging from midair on metal rails. Uh, basically anything that looks like, smells like, feels like, and has all of the elements of a conventional railway. So by that I mean signalling, I mean you have to have some sort of method of powering the system, it has some contact with the ground, either physical or hovery. It has a dedicated right of way. It will have high tolerances, so you know, curvature that has to deal with the speeds, dedicated ticketing, uh, platforms so you can get on and off these things. It follows a set path. All of these sorts of features that make it a railway, except that the people who create them take away the one thing that makes railways unbeatably good, which is the contact between a wheel and a rail. They take away the wheels and rails and replace them with other stuff that make them more rubbish. So why is that? First of all, it's worth maybe very, very briefly explaining why railways are so good. So back in, uh, back in 1801, uh, Cornish mining engineer Richard Trevithick uh, started attaching high-pressure steam engines to wheeled carriages. And a couple of years later, uh, in 1804, he ran a locomotive along the existing tramway uh, between Penadaran and Abercanon uh, in South Wales. Uh, by 1825, the Stockton Darlington Railway opened as the first modern railway system, and the world was pretty much forever changed as a result. Whilst developments to locomotive technology came on in leaps and bounds, uh, the infrastructure upon which it sat didn't necessarily undergo the same radical development. Trains have got more and more powerful over successive decades, but the simplicity and functionality of railway tracks means that very little has changed in their fundamental arrangement since the 1800s, and actually even before that. But why is that? The success of the railway owes everything to the interface between the wheel and the rail. The principle of load transfer, combined with the strength of steel, permits the stress of the railhead to be really high, uh, which gives a contact patch under each wheel no larger than a five pence piece. Such a small area means that friction is kept really low. All this boils down to one fundamental truth. The rail is currently four times less carbon intensive than the alternatives, road, air, and even maglev, but we'll get to that. So this video is gonna be based on a thread I did quite a while back about maglev, what it is, does it work, where is it working, yeah, it was basically in response to, I kept referring to Hyperloop in my eternal battles against that nonsense as being rehashed maglev, which it is, and that's why it's rubbish. So before diving into the history, uh, it's probably worth doing a bit of a technology recap. Maglev, which is kind of a contraction of magnetic levitation, in its most basic form is, um, well, it's as simple as it sounds. When you hold two magnets of equivalent polarity against each other, they repel. When you line up a load of magnets as a track, you end up with an arrangement that kind of resembles an unwound motor, uh, hence the technology that moves maglev trains about being referred to as, um, well, not so much anymore, but it used to be referred to quite often as the linear motor. Before any actual design went on, lots of patents were granted in all directions for infrastructure proposals that kind of resembled maglev, uh, but the first actual use of the word maglev was in 1975. These, these similar ideas had actually been patented way back, you know, as early as 1905. So it was quite an old idea even, even then. But between 1905 uh, onwards, a lot of these patents, these early patents, were just really ideas on paper. The German engineer Hermann Kemper uh, did build a working model in 1935, but the person who built the first full-size working linear motor in the late 1940s was the Lancashire-born electrical engineer, Professor Eric Lathwaite. 
Uh, his linear induction motor, which, um, which was so-called because the magnetic field induces eddy currents in the metal passing over it, which creates a repelling force. So you get linear induction because the induced magnetic field. That was designed to permit high speeds and efficiencies. And to be honest, you can go onto Wikipedia to get the super sciencey bit. But even then, British Rail, so the, uh, the operator of the railways in Britain at the time, were kind of interested in this. And it's because they had a kind of a key problem. And actually, it's a problem that wasn't unique to British Rail. This was happening across the world. The railways had reached the buffer stops in terms of performance. So the way that wheels work on trains is that they are a cone shape. And they kind of wobble, if you like, back into position as they're moving along. And so they're kind of self-regulating. And that motion is called hunting. It's hunting for equilibrium. At high speeds, this hunting motion increases rolling resistance and reduces energy efficiency. So as trains got faster, this hunting problem started requiring more and more, much more energy. And actually, essentially, you had a limitation on how fast trains could go. Lathwaite, supported by British Rail, was convinced that his contactless linear induction motor technology could solve this problem. Throughout the 1960s, he refined the LIM, as we're going to call it for now, uh, into a form called the double-sided sandwich motor. At around the same time, Hovercraft Development Limited were looking at a hovertrain concept, so kind of something kind of different. That's based on hovercraft, not on uh, maglev and magnets. Uh, but they called it the tracked hovercraft. Again, check it out on Wikipedia. Never comfortable with putting all their eggs in one basket, British Rail had also been researching improved suspension for high-speed trains. This was pioneered by Dr. Alan Wickens and his work, particularly using a vehicle called HSF-V1, the High Speed Freight Vehicle 1, which you can find up in Shildon, uh, which is arguably one of the most important rail vehicles still in existence, um, that's in its original condition, or close to its original condition. Dr. Alan Wickens is one of the three most important railway engineers. First you have Trevithick, then you have the Stevensons, George and Robert, father and son, and then you get Dr. Alan Wickens. And I'm sure I'll talk a lot about him at some point in many videos in the future. His work with his team at British Rail Research uh, determined that improvements to the design of uh, what we call yaw dampers, so that's if you look down uh, on a train from above and it's kind of moving from side to side, that's yaw. And if you imagine the bogies, so those are the little tracks under each coach that have the wheels attached, to stop them hunting around, you put yaw dampers in that kind of steady that motion depending on the speed of the train. So improving that design pretty much eliminated the hunting effect on conventional rails. This was absolutely brilliant work, by the way. Um, the, the 1960s and 70s truly were the glory days of rail boffinry. British Rail Research Division's work gave us the railway we recognise today, pretty much. The volume of study in, in transportation engineering more generally just has not been replicated. Cracking this problem eroded Maglev's energy efficiency advantage over conventional rail, making its benefits less clear. So to be honest, before it had even started, the railway had defeated Maglev. With little justification for reconstructing huge tracts of the rail infrastructure, British Rail and Lathwaite, dear old Eric Lathwaite, parted ways back in 1967. This didn't stop him though. He joined forces with the tracked hovercraft team and, following some pretty significant tinkering, helped RTV31 reach 167 km an hour on its test track in the Cambridgeshire Fens. That was in February of 1973. The trouble was, the same short-sightedness that prevented the UK from building its own conventional high-speed network also precluded the construction of a hovertrain-capable one. The week after its fabled test run, the tracked hovercraft project was cancelled. Uh, Lathwaite later admitted that the hovertrain concept was flawed and that he preferred a maglev arrangement as by that point it had been coined. There are a few scattered remains of the original test track and RTV31 has been lovingly restored at Railworld and you can go and see it where it deserves to be as a relic in Peterborough. British Rail hadn't entirely abandoned their interest in the uh, linear induction motor though. They actually collaborated again with Lathwaite uh, in the mid-80s to open the first commercially operational maglev line at Birmingham Airport. That was in 1984 actually. It was called Maglev uh, and um, yeah, it was a bit unreliable. Eventually it was completely replaced. Uh, maglev actually is in York, it's in the National Railway Museum. and I'd, uh, I'd recommend going and having a look at it and maybe laughing at it. Maglev speed uh, could be described as pedestrian at best. For the first true high-speed maglev system, and not just a linear induction motor, we have to head over to Germany. Enter Krauss Maffei's Transrapid. Back in 1969, the first Transrapid prototype was tested on a 600mm long tabletop track, but by 1971, a full-scale demonstrator appeared in the form of Transrapid 02. By 1973, so that's only you know, a few years after a first tabletop prototype, Transrapid 04 broke 250km an hour. By 1979, Transrapid 05 was being tested on a semi-permanent track. Yeah, infrastructure always slows stuff down, right? 
By the time Birmingham Airport's maglev had opened in 1984, the Transrapid test facility in Emsland, Germany was operating, and Transrapid 06 had been publicly exhibited. Uh, these things pretty much look like Star Trek shuttles. Kind of nice design aesthetic they've got going on. But at this point everything slowed down, all that is if you ignore the fact that the uh, system pushed through the 400 and 450 kilometer an hour barriers. Uh, as a bit of an addendum, during this period Berlin's M-Bahn, which was like a metro style uh, linear induction motor system on wheels, appeared. It then almost immediately disappeared again. To be honest that's pretty much all there is to say about that. The politics is more interesting than the line itself, and it isn't pure maglev, so shrug face. Where were we? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Communist China. <laughs> China's government had been planning a high-speed rail network since the late 1970s, but only in December 1990 did they manage to submit the first actual proposal, and this was for a new line between Beijing and Shanghai. The trouble was, and, uh, and there's a lesson in here somewhere, the Chinese government couldn't make up its mind between using conventional rail technology or this newfangled maglev. Experts agreed that conventional technology made the most sense, but officials successively queried this conclusion. The debate raged on for another 10 years until, in 2000, a very big bone was thrown to Maglev's proponents by the Shanghai Municipal Government. They would part fund construction of a new Transrapid line to link the city to Pudong Airport. The Germans had found their first buyers. The Shanghai Maglev train became the world's first high-speed passenger Maglev service when the first paying customer stepped aboard in 2004. Operating up to 430 km an hour, it's the fastest commercial railway in the world. It has also been a colossal failure. Built as an off-the-shelf proving ground for the technology, it was expected that a cascade of orders from Germany and the rest of the world would follow. Transrapid's German backers provided a significant proportion of the total costs, and the German government got involved too. Actually, the German and Chinese governments locked horns over this one in a big way. Its substantial cost, minimal capacity, and wranglings over technology transfer killed the chances of this system being expanded over China stone dead. Meanwhile, the success of the trial Qingdao to Shenyang line proved the superiority of conventional high-speed rail, and the Chinese authorities proceeded to build 25,000 kilometres of it. Tragically, things went from bad to worse for Transrapid. In 2006, during a routine test run, Transrapid 08 collided with a maintenance vehicle at speed near Lathen, killing and severely injuring 33 people. The Emsland test track was demolished in 2012, and Transrapid was all but wound up. This isn't the end of the story, though. We haven't mentioned Japan yet. Let's jump back to the 1960s. Uh, Japan started operating its world-renowned bullet trains in 1964, but even before opening and proving highly successful, they'd resolved to go even faster. Between 1962 and 1969, the Japanese National Railways attempted to create their own linear motor railway to do precisely that. I'm uh, not drawing any conclusions here, but immediately after a patent for a new type of maglev was placed in the US, they succeeded. Unlike Lathwaite or Transrapid system, which relied on a kind of a track, the Japanese used superconducting electromagnets for levitation and propulsion within a guideway. So track versus a guideway. The first trial run was in 1972, and in 1980 the familiar U-shaped guideway appeared. Chuo Shinkansen had arrived. In 1997 a new test track opened in Yamanashi on the route of a future line between Tokyo and Osaka. This thing was fast. Passengers on test trains have ridden at over 500 km an hour, and the L0 series train has clocked a staggering 603 km an hour. Chuo Shinkansen was kind of being developed with two key purposes in mind. The first was as a bypass for the already saturated high-speed network in Japan. The second was for earthquake proofing. Conventional railways have very tight tolerances at high speeds. You're looking at tolerances of maybe you know 0.5 millimeters either way before you start hearing a major bang, and within much more than 25 millimeters, you're gonna derail a train. Maglev, of this particular design, because the trains are floating, gives you about 150 millimeters of tolerance. So if you've got an earthquake rocking your railway around, you do have a safer system, or at least you have a system that can run again once the dust settles. The trouble is, the operating speed of 505 kilometers an hour still requires a very straight alignment. 90% of the new line will be in tunnels. And this is not cheap. In fact, this line is expected to cost quite a bit more than Crossrail will, which is an incredibly complex, tunnelled city metro system. With the development process having been so inordinately pricey, the Japanese government has to build something to show for it, and build it they shall. The final line between Tokyo and Osaka will hopefully open in 2037, a whopping 47 years after construction started, and actually that's still being delayed. There are two footnotes in this story, and we stay in Japan for the first. 
Linimo, or the Aichi High Speed Transit Tobukuryu line, opened in 2005 to serve an exhibition and was kind of left in situ. Despite its lightweight design, it still costs 56 million euros per kilometre, and it kind of remains a loss maker. The fifth and probably the penultimate commercial maglev operation is South Korea's Incheon Airport Maglev, which opened in 2016. Uh, again, this one started as a test track back in 2006. The line has found some success, partly because it's free, and there are plans for its expansion. Both of these lines are isolated metro-style operations, and their technology is more closely related to Lathwaite's original uh, linear induction motor than the superconducting guideway of Chuo Shinkansen. They both operate at around about 100 km an hour and have capacities similar to a modern light rapid transit system. Anyway, this gives us the full complement of commercial maglev. Birmingham's maglev, which has been replaced. The Berlin M-Bahn, which has also been replaced. The Shanghai Trans Rapid, which is very much a white elephant. Japan's Linimo, which is loss making. And the Incheon Airport maglev, which is fair play, doing all right. And lastly, Chuo Shinkansen, which is still under construction, and who knows when it'll actually end up opening. So if you'll pardon the expression, not a great track record. To round things up, Maglev railways are more expensive and less energy efficient than their steel-on-steel -steel equivalents, and in spite of over 50 years of tests and trials, there is still no dedicated Maglev intercity line. Hyperloop is just the latest barmy iteration of this gadget band technology, and given all of this experience of failure, is it worth yet more wasted human effort? That's for you to decide. And what of Professor Eric Lathwaite, the father of maglev? After tinkering with gyroscopes and moths, yeah, the little sort of flappy things that eat your clothes, he ended up working with NASA on using linear induction motor technology to launch stuff up into space. In 1997, at age 77, he collapsed in his lab and never woke up. The story of maglev is a fascinating and at times tragic one, but it also contains lots of lessons for scientists, engineers, economists and entrepreneurs. In transport, as much as in all walks of life, as we look to the future, it's always worth keeping one eye on the past. So uh, yeah, that was my video on maglev, and uh, the first in a series on gadget bands. And good grief, the world keeps throwing us lots of gadget bands to do videos about. Uh, if you enjoyed that, please feel free to drop me a coffee on ko-free.com, and pop a like and a subscribe if you don't already, and hopefully there'll be another one of these coming along soon. Cheerio!